Well, salutations, saints. Good to see you guys. You know, uh, one person posted online when we posted this said, you know, what a blessing it is to have growing pains. You know, and uh, sometimes we lose sight of um, blessings. And, and this is just a little bit of a, a growing pain. So um, I'm thankful for leadership uh, like Pastor Jeff, Pastor Weaver, and uh, we, we love you guys. And our, our heart is to stay unified. We've been unified for 32 years. We plan to be unified for another 32 years and another 32 years after that, right? Hey, God is good. This morning, I'm going to be preaching a message titled, Unlocking God's Will for Your Life. Unlocking God's Will for Your Life. And I'm going to be giving you, 930, the key to unlocking God's will for your life. Now, just by a show of hands, how many would say that you feel very confident that right now you are in the center of what God's will is for your life? And you're like, man, I'm, I'm there. I'm living in that, right? Okay, yeah. There's awesome. How many people would say, I have no idea what God's will is for my life, and I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm feeling a little bit lost here. Yeah, yeah, we got some of those. How many of you say, I'm somewhere in the middle, right? Like, I, I've, I've got some things where I feel pretty secure and confident about it. Any of those in the middle people? Well, this is my prayer, is that we would all be open to what the Spirit of God is speaking to each of us as individuals, each of us uniquely, and we would take a step of obedience towards the center of God's will. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, and as you turn to Matthew chapter 25, I want to talk just briefly and explain the difference between being in the center of God's will versus being close to God's will. If you were to get in your car, head out here, head north on 70th Street, head west on Meredith, head north again on 86, get on the interstate and head south. And you head south for about two and a half hours. You'd come just on the outskirts of Kansas City to a town called Bonner Springs. Has anybody ever been to Bonner Springs? Bonner Springs has an amphitheater, which is an outdoor concert venue, and I've been to two concerts there, and it was fantastic both times. The first time I went with a group of eight of us or so, we went to see Jack Johnson. And if you've never been to this amphitheater in Bonner Springs, uh, you walk in, kind of walk up this hill, and there's this giant grass hill where people can bring their blankets. You can kind of lounge, listen to the band, listen to the music, you know, just kind of you're hanging out on the hill. And then you get down, and then, I don't know, there might be 1,500, 2,000 seats that are pretty close to the, the, the stage and the platform. And then in front of the seats, there's standing room only that's first come, first serve. Now, Back when I went to this concert, that was like, I'm like, I'm all in. Like, let's, let's go. And so we're like, <laughs> the power, Karen walk, you know, um, getting, getting to the front. And um, we, uh, we, our goal was to get as close to the platform or the stage as possible. And so throughout all the opening bands, people are going and getting water. They're dropping like flies. I'm like, you're weak, you know, weak. <laughs> and we're, we're making our way up. And eventually we get to about two people in front uh, of the stage where they've got the barricade, you know, that protects the artists and stuff. And we're right there and we can see the expression on Jack's face and, and he's interacting with the crowd and you can see the sweat dripping down and it's just this incredible, incredible experience being uh, up close. The second time I went, uh, I don't know if it was a mistake or the Lord's blessing, but um, how many are familiar with the, the restaurant Fogo de Chao? Okay, Fogo de Chao is an all-you-can-eat Brazilian steakhouse uh, restaurant, and uh, it's my favorite restaurant, so if you want to get me a gift card there, I will not refuse that blessing, you know, flowing through you. But um, we, uh, um, we went to Fogo, and we ate, and I ate, and I ate, and I ate. And then we're going to this concert, and I realized something. Standing for long periods of time is not an option. That's not going to happen, especially in August. Like, I'm going to park myself on the lawn so that I can lay down and lift up my shirt and let the meat sweats begin as I'm digesting all of this meat. And so we're there, and I'm watching this band, and we're on the lawn, and the sound sounds amazing, but there was just this difference of experience between concert one and concert two. 
Like, it, it was great, but I wasn't in the concert. I wasn't right there. I wasn't wrapped up in the center of it. And so we're on the grass lawn, and it was sounding great. We could tell that the set list was getting down to the end, and we're like, we've got a long drive back to Des Moines. I don't want to get back at, like, 2 o'clock in the morning. Let's beat the parking lot traffic. Because how many know that parking lot traffic is the worst? Sporting events, concerts, it's the worst. That's when true Christianity is, in, is on display, Right? <laughs> It's, it's the truth. So I'm just like not even going to test my Christianity. We're going to leave early. So we, we uh, leave, and I get outside the gates, and it's a big gravel parking lot. I don't know if they've paved it since, but it's gravel. And man, I can hear the closing song. I'm like, oh man, this sounds awesome. I turned to my friend Grant. I said, man, next time let's skip the $70 ticket. We'll just, we'll get here early. We'll tailgate. We'll throw bags. We'll just we'll just listen to the concert out in the parking lot. You know, and some of you are like, that sounds like a great idea. You know, and it, it kind of was a great idea until I started to think about it. You know, there's a huge difference between a parking lot experience and a front row experience. And if I would have said to someone, yeah, I went to the Need to Breathe concert last night. They were awesome. Well, I, I didn't actually see them but I heard them from the parking lot. I don't think anybody that I tell that to would say, yeah, he went to the concert, right? There's a difference between being close, being on the lawn and being right up in the middle of the concert. See, it's my fear that there are many who think that they are at the center of God's will, that they have arrived, that they are there, and that this is it, this is life, this is, this is God's blessing, this is as good as it gets uh, for me, when in reality, you're still sitting in the parking lot. When in reality, you're still on the grass field. See, there's a blessing that flows from being in the center of God's will. And the closer you get to the center of God's will, the deeper and greater that blessing becomes in your life. Don't be deceived that just because you can hear music that you're at the center of God's will. In other words, just because you're seeing spiritual fruit in your life doesn't mean that you're, you've arrived. It could mean that you've got more. Because I, I don't want to just see the fruit. I don't want to just smell the fruit. I want to be in the fruit. I want to be at the center of God's will. And that's my heart this morning, that we collectively, as a church, would take one step closer to being in the center of God's will. That's why this schedule change, this potential schedule change, that's why this needs to be a matter of prayer and not just what makes sense to us. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? Because we want, to, we want the church to be at the center of God's will. So, Pastor Zach says this all the time. You're here not by accident. You're here on purpose, for a purpose, and God has something for each and every one of you. And so I just encourage you this morning as the Lord speaks to you, let's take a step closer to the center of God's will. Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to ask that you stand as I read. Now, I know that I'm asking you to move, and it's hot, but... Believe it or not, it's about three or four degrees cooler in this service than it was in the eight o'clock service. So praise the Lord for all of his mercies and his goodness. Matthew chapter 25, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, starting in verse 14. You can follow along with me. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each accordingly to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained you two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 24, then the man who had received the one talent came. 
Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one that has 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heavenly Father, I pray that through your spirit that this word would be quickened to our hearts, that you would reveal things in our hearts that we need to surrender to you. I pray that we would not just come in here and intellectually hear something, but your spirit would change our hearts, equip us, God, to do and be the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now before you find your seat, turn to your neighbor and tell them your favorite item at Chick-fil-A. Right now, tell them, favorite item at Chick-fil-A. You can find your seats. Chick-fil-A. See, the, the, the Bible says to share in each other's sufferings, and I crave Chick-fil-A on Sundays, and it's closed, so I'm just going to make you all crave Chick-fil-A. Anybody else, like, crave the Jesus chicken on Jesus Day, right? It's every day is Jesus Day, okay? Don't read into that. Some of you are uh, kind of scratching your head thinking, Pastor Austin, how am I supposed to unlock God's will for my life when you read a, a parable like this. Anybody think that? What does this parable have anything to do with unlocking God's will for my life? And I would tell you everything. This parable has everything to do with you unlocking God's will for your life. I'm gonna give you the key right here. The key to unlocking God's will for your life is stewardship demonstrated by obedience. It's stewardship demonstrated by obedience. It's obedience. Look at verse 21 and verse 23. We see the master's response. He says to these that have stewarded his belongings well. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few. Turn to your neighbor and say few. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. What Jesus is communicating that is that if you can be trusted with a little bit of fill in the blank, with a little bit of time, with a little bit of resources, with a little bit of money, with a little bit of relationships, with a little bit of responsibilities, if you can be trusted with a little bit of anything, then you will be trusted with more. God can trust you with more. God trusts us with many different things. He gives us money that we are supposed to steward. He gives us relationships that we are supposed to steward. He gives us time. Time. Your time, God has given you, not so that you can waste it, so that you can what? You can steward it. But one thing I don't feel that we often think about in the aspect of being a good steward of is stewarding God's word. What are you doing with God's word. See, God has gifted us his holy word. God has gifted us the Bible. How are you stewarding the word of God that's been planted and sown in your life? What do I mean by that? How are you responding to the word of God in your life? What are you doing with God's word in your life? I feel as though many have romanticized the unwritten will of God. What do I mean by unwritten will of God? Let's start there, okay? The unwritten will of God is anything in life that isn't clearly spelled out in scripture, like who am I gonna marry? What's my job occupation gonna be? Where am I gonna go to college? Where am I gonna live? What type of house am I gonna be in? What neighborhood? This, that, all of these big decisions that God can and oftentimes and sometimes does have say over. That's the unwritten will of God. And what do I mean that we romanticize the unwritten will of God? Is what I mean is, is that we often dream about all of these different possibilities. We like to think, well, maybe it's God's will that I'd marry a supermodel. 
You know, maybe it's God's will that my business is just super successful and we're just able to expand location after location. Maybe it's just God's will that we do this and do that. And the endless possibility and the mysterious nature about the unwritten will of God leaves us romanticizing it, leaves us dreaming up all these endless possibilities of adventure and excitement. And there's a lot of potential in the unwritten will because it's it's yet to be known. We don't know what's in store for us. And so we tend to romanticize it while on the other hand, we tend to kind of ignore and neglect the written will of God. What do I mean the written will of God? I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the words of Jesus. Some people even call the written will of God as being outdated or calling it religion because that's the way things were. We're enlightened now. We, we've grown now, and, and people will begin to speak negatively of God's written will for your life. We love the idea that God has something specific for each and every single one of us, but we often kind of like to skip the corporate will through God's word and just want to focus on our individual will. Can I, I just ask a question? Just, just evaluate in your own hearts. If God has already given you steps A, B, and C through his written will, yet you are continually living in disobedience, why on earth would God reveal steps D, E, and F to you? If, if you can't juggle the three balls that the Lord has asked you to juggle, why is he going to add balls four, five, and six for you to make a mess of? If you're stumbling over the hurdles and the responsibilities and the things that God has asked you to steward of today through his written word, why is he going to pile on more for you? God has your future in his hands, some people get so caught up in all the specifics of the uncertainties of their unwritten will that they completely neglect God's written will. They aren't stewarding what's been asked of them. Can I just encourage you, as you begin to become a good steward of the word of God, as you begin to focus on what he's already asked you and given you to do, and you begin to focus on what's in front of you right now, the things of the future, they don't matter. They, they, don't, they aren't scary anymore. You don't need to worry about tomorrow because why? Tomorrow will worry about itself. You can trust that the Lord has your future in his hands as long as you just begin to do what you have to do today and you don't worry about it. Psalms 37, 23 in the New Living Translation. 37, 23 if you're taking notes. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. Does that give anybody some peace in their heart that God is directing the steps of the godly? He delights in every detail of their lives. God delights in the details of your life. That means he's excited about your future and he's ordaining, he's directing your steps. God's got your future in your hands, but some of you are so worried about what's next that you're completely neglecting what you're supposed to be doing now. What do I mean by this? 1 Corinthians six eighteen says, flee from sexual immorality. Yet I wonder how many would let me look through your internet search history, that let me open up your Instagram and go to the discover page on the Instagram and see what you're discovering on Instagram. And you've got zero plans to change what you're involving yourself in when scripture clearly says flee from all sexual immorality. James 1.21 says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Yet some of you have been convicted time and time again about your entertainment diet. What do I mean by your entertainment diet? I'm not talking like, ooh, Cheeto, that's entertainment. No, I'm talking about what you ingest through entertainment. And God has convicted you of what you're filling your minds and your hearts and your household and your kids' minds and your kids' hearts and your, the household, that, but you've got no plans on changing it. You've got no plans on getting rid of every moral filth that is so prevalent around you. If you were to go look on your Netflix or your Paramount Plus or your, your Hulu or, or YouTube or whatever account it is, it's just ungodly content after ungodly content after ungodly content, and you've got zero plans of changing that. And yet the Lord has spoken to you and he's convicted you. 
Matthew 6, 15, Jesus says this, if you don't forgive men of their sins, then your heavenly Father won't forgive your sins. Some of you have never truly forgiven someone in your family, and it's been decades. You've walked with the Lord, and people at church think you're this wonderful spiritual giant, yet what they don't know is that you've carried a, a seed of unforgiveness for decades, for 30, 40, 50 years, and, and it's just, well, you don't know what they did to me. I was the victim. I didn't ask that upon myself. I didn't do this. And you've walked with resentment and grudge and hate in your heart towards an individual, and the Lord has convicted you dozens of times to forgive, and yet you still refuse to forgive. You are not stupid stewarding his word to forgive. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Tell me when it gets too hot in here. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, of all the produce, of all the produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Some of you know that you should tithe, yet you just decide to tip God. Or after all your deductions of your insurance and your different things, and I don't want to get into legalism, but it's just like, well, my paycheck only says this, so that's how much I'm going to tithe on the paycheck, when in reality, your benefit package is much more than that. Maybe it's disobedience in another area of finances. You've never truly trusted the Lord with your finances because you're putting the pencil, and the pencil doesn't make sense, but God is saying, I own everything. I'm the God of abundance. You don't think that I can't provide what I'm asking you for back? Some of you feel stuck in your business and you're like, I can't go anywhere. Maybe it's time that you start tithing on your business. Now, I'm not saying that. It's like, I'm just preaching God's word here. Matthew 28, 19, 20, Jesus commands us, the Great Commission. How many know it? Therefore, go, preach, teach, baptize, make disciples of all nations, of all kinds, everywhere. Disciple them. Hear me, church. Some of you wouldn't even be able to tell me who the last person you shared your faith with. Who was the last person that you witnessed to? Meaning that, that you said, man, this is what Jesus has done for me in my life. Do you know Jesus? Are you gonna go to heaven? And yet you've walked with the Lord for decades. James 1.27 says religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Yet some of you are empty nesters or don't have children or are consumed with making a living, thinking about next year, your next vacation, or plum don't think it's your job to take care of the orphans and widows of Des Moines. Or you just pacify it and say, well, I support Royal Family Kids because I write a check every year. Or I, I support Wildwood Hills. Or I, I do this and I just, I just write a check and that's how I'm supporting these ministries. When in reality, the Lord is asking you to get off your hiney and say, you know what, you are a school teacher for this. You know what, you had children and you worked through algebra. You know what, you've got time on your hands. You know what, you've got this. You've got some love in your heart. You don't have to know it all. I'm not calling the equipped. I'm just asking you to say yes. And there is someone in this city that needs you, that needs a father. Did you know that now more than ever we've got a fatherless society? And I'm not just talking talking about a fatherless society of, of split homes. I'm talking about absent fathers. Fathers that are too consumed with making a living or doing this or that. Did you know that grandparents, older people in the room, single people in the room, anybody in the room, that you can make a difference in one person's life if you'd just be willing to say yes? Yeah, FCA is a great opportunity to do this. I was a, the chaplain for the, the Dallas Center Grimes football team. And I got to go and pray with those boys for like three years. I had to start saying no to some things because my season of life began to change as we start to having kids. But I look forward someday when seasons change that I get to step back in and start getting to say yes to some of those things, right? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like volleyball or softball. Or maybe you don't even know sports. Maybe you're, you're fat and, and you hate running and, and you just say like, I'm going to go, I'm going to be the chaplain for for, uh, uh, you know, track, you know? Kids, go out there and run. Do your thing while I eat my Krispy Kreme, you know? Whatever it is, okay? God might be asking you to, to do something. 
Are you willing to say yes? See, here's the problem. People sit and they wonder. They say like, God, why aren't you revealing the next steps for my life? Why aren't you unlocking your will for my life? Why can't I get clarity about this next thing in my life? And God is sitting back and he's asking this, why can't you do what I've already asked you to do? Why won't you steward what I've already asked you to steward? Why won't you obey me at my word and my command? I've convicted you. I've, I've lovingly brought you back to the point of opportunity to change, to have action, and yet you still don't do it. Don't overcomplicate God's will for your life. I worked with college age students for the first eight years of ministry. You know what they like to do? They like to overcomplicate God's will for their life. How? They want to know what they're going to be doing at 27 years old instead of at 20 years old. And they're more concerned with the hurdles down the road than they are right now. And then they're just fumbling all over the, the hurdles that God's asking them to entrust them with in that moment. Don't overcomplicate God's will for your life. God's will is more than a career. God's will is more than who you marry. God's will is more than where you live. It's more than any big decisions in life. God's will is anything and everything that he might ask you to do. And as soon as you neglect to do what he's asked you to do, whether by a conviction of the Holy Spirit or whether by revelation through the word of God, is the minute that you step out of the center of God's will. It's the minute that you are leaving God's will for your life. Hear me, New Hope. Living a life of stewardship demonstrated by obedience is living a life that is in the center of God's will. It's plain and simple. It's as that. You want to get to the center of God's will? Live a life that is uh, of stewardship that's demonstrated by obedience, and you will find yourself flowing in the center of God's will. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. You don't, you don't need to know what your next five years is, your 10 years. Yeah, you might have an idea. God might give you some dreams and visions. There's some dreams and visions that the Lord has placed in my heart that I was 19 years old, and I'm nowhere near that. But I'm not pursuing those things. I'm just stewarding what God has given me in this moment. I'm glad that I don't know if those things are gonna come true. I, I'm just like, God, whatever you give me today, I'm gonna do my best with it with all of my heart, with all of my soul, for your glory, for your fame, and tomorrow I'll do the same. Amen. Would that be your heart this morning, just to be a forever yes to Jesus? I ask you this, if the will of God for your life is just to go to work, to make enough to pay the bills, to be faithful to your spouse, raise God-fearing children, it's his will to be a student of God's word, serve the church, serve the community, minister to your coworkers, tithe, obey scripture, and live to what might seem to some a very basic Christian, basic life. I want you to hear me, New Hope. That is no less of a calling than someone being asked to move overseas and be a missionary. It's about obedience it's not about gifts. When we get to heaven, we are not going to be rewarded based on our results here on earth. How many are thankful for that? We're gonna be rewarded for what? Our obedience. It's, it's, that's all it is. It's our, be, it's our obedience. Most people struggle with comparison. They drive a newer car than me. They're in a nicer house than me, a nicer development. They've got a more beautiful spouse than me. Their kids are worse behaved than mine. We compare, compare, compare. We even compare like gifts, right? Well, I gave them, uh, the bride and groom, a vacuum while they gave them Clarence hand towels with Kohl's cash, right? Like, can I just tell you that God is not concerned with equal gifts? He's concerned with equal obedience, and whether God asks you in a mission service to give $50 or $5 or to go over and, and uh, serve and start training and learning a new language, there is no difference in the high calling that God is asking you in each and every opportunity for yes. We need to stop idolizing different people's giftings or different people's callings over our own. You understand that? Like I, I was... Like I said, college pastor for eight years, they are really difficult to minister to. Like, it, it, it's really tough. Why? Because they're like toddlers where they think they know what they're doing and they want to do it themselves, but they're making themselves a mess. 
right? Like that is just a stage of life. They've got keys, they've got money, and they think they know better than you, and they're like toddlers except 20 years old. And I don't say that to be mean. Not everyone is like that at that age group, but that's, it's, it's really, really tough. And there were times in the college ministry where, where I, I just felt like, man, God, what, what do you want? Like, is this all it's ever going to be? And I would long to have something that looked a little bit different. You know, you know, the group never grew more consistently than maybe 20. We'd have seasons where we'd have 45 or 50, and then we'd have seasons, and I remember some nights where we'd have seven students show up. But I also remember on some of those nights, those were the nights that students were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Those were the nights where people were being broken free of, of addictions to pornography and different things and like that. And I remember looking at the ministry and thinking, God, is this all that you're going to ask me to do? And him saying, don't you ever say that this is all that you're asking me to do. Because if you can't steward seven people, why would I give you 7,000? If you, if you can't, if you can't, um, and don't, don't get me wrong, I do not want to steward 7,000 people. That sounds like going bald and gray really quick, okay? Um, if you can't be content with what I'm asking and what I'm asking you to steward right now, why would I give you more? If you won't shepherd the 25 students, the 50 students, the 60 or 80 students that I was in constant relationship with at Zeroff on University, if you can't do that, then why would, I, why, why would I entrust you with more? And I had to grow comfortable in understanding as a pastor that my ministry, that not my ministry, it's the Lord's ministry, but the ministry that I oversaw was going to look different than Salt Company or is going to look different than this or it's going to look different than that because I am different. And that's not what God's asking me to do. He's asking me to say yes for today. I'm rambling a little bit. I hope that made sense. One of the things that I just can't stand the term is the term full-time ministry. Have you ever heard that? Well, you're in full-time ministry. You know what? Be quiet. We're all in full-time ministry. And your nine to five job is no less important than someone who's on the mission field or someone standing in this pulpit. It's no less important. The will of God might not be what you want for your life, but hear me, it's important. And your yes and your obedience, your stewardship through obedience is important. I want to ask you all to stand. We're going to end in a time of worship and prayer. And the song that we sang earlier about surrendering to God is, is what we're going to sing. It says, I will trust in only you. No one can add to your perfection. You're the beginning and the end more than I can comprehend. There's no one like you. I lift my hands to heaven. Hear my heart surrendered. You know, a lot of people struggle with anxiety and worry about the future, about the will of God and what they're doing because they don't fully trust God. Can I just ask this with every eye open across this room, if, if you're here today and you say, I'm struggling to trust God with the will of God in my life and my future, would you just raise your hand and say, I'm struggling a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And you're here this morning and, and you'd say, man, I feel like I'm stuck. I feel like you, Pastor Austin, where there is a sense of, of change and you're stewarding A, B, and C well, but God hasn't quite revealed D, E, and F. And it's just like, is he ever going to reveal that next stage? And you're just like, man, what is it? What is it next? Can I just encourage you? I want to encourage you. Keep on stewarding what God is giving you to steward. It will come. Whatever it is, it will come. And it's going to be awesome. And the timing is God's timing and it's perfect. How many would say that there's an area in your life that you need to make right with God? He's asked A, B, and C through his written word. You've been convicted in an area of your life. You say, man, I need to get on it. There's some change that needs to happen. You say, yep, yep, there's, there's, maybe it's finances. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's uh, serving in an area. You just say, I, I need to, to get right with God and stay right with God. I need to continually say yes to him. Maybe you'd say, I've got a loved one who is far from the will of God. And I know that they aren't anywhere from the near will of God, but I'm just going to stand in the gap in faith for them today and just say, I want to bring them back into the family of God. I'm going to stand. Yeah. Yeah, I've been talking all about the will of God. But the will of God is this. Second Peter 3, 9 says that it's his will or his desire that all be saved that all know him, 
John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For he did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the will of God, is that you would be saved. So with every eye closed and head bowed, is there anyone here that would say, I'm stepping into the will of the Father. I've never put my trust in him. I've never received the peace of knowing that God is with me, he is for me, that he's forgiven me, that he's got a purpose, a plan, and a future for me, and that he, he's, he's wanting to save me. And you just say for the first time, I'm putting my trust in him. I'm stepping into salvation. I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins. If that's you this morning, with every eye closed and head bowed, would, would you just raise your hand across this room? Is there anyone here that say, I, I'm stepping into the will. I need salvation this morning. Yes, I see you, young lady. God, I pray right now that you would bless this one individual. I pray that she would feel the forgiveness, that the stain of guilt and shame, the past, the regret, the remorse, whatever is going on in her heart, Lord, I pray that that would be lifted as your presence just begins to pour on her from heaven. I pray that she would receive God, your spirit in her and that you would remind her of the things that she was taught as a child and that she would begin to walk on the, the straight path of righteousness and by your Holy Spirit, she would walk in confidence knowing that you love her, that you have what's best for her. And so God, this morning for everyone here, I pray that we would trust in your ways. You are the perfecter of our steps. You direct it. You delight in our futures. And so this morning, we just simply say yes yes to whatever you might be asking. We put our trust in you. I pray that a spirit of rest would come over our hearts and our minds. That we would know and trust and believe that you're a God of abundance. That you're a God who has a plan for our life. And your ways are higher than ours. Your ways are better than ours. Anything that we could dream or imagine, you have better things for us because you are a God that is amazing. And so God, this morning as we just give up our control to you and say take the reins of our minds, take the reins of our mouth, take the reins of our actions and our hearts, Lord, and lead us wherever you would have us, God. I pray for those who are up in age that feel like they've missed a boat. I pray that they would evidently see a new ship that's coming and that they would know that you are a God of the future, that you are a God that has something for them in their uh, late years, God. I pray for the individual that feels like they've done too much wrong, that you are a God who is merciful, that you use fishermen, you use tax collectors, you use all sorts of people to spread the gospel, to spread the good news, Jesus. So God, we just give you control this morning. We trust that your way is best. Your way is best, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Your obedience, church, your obedience is directly linked to unlocking God's will for your life. If you, my, my prayer is if you felt any form of conviction of anything, that you wouldn't dismiss, you wouldn't think it's a manipulative pastor, but you'd recognize it, that it's from the Spirit of God that is loving, kind, and gracious, and He wants what's best for you. So please respond. God bless you. See you back tonight. Pastor Jeff speaking, 6 p.m. Let's uh, be friendly on our way out, and we'll see you guys tonight or next week.